How many of you have come to receive the word tonight? The, this is a word church, and I'm grateful for the privilege to declare God's word today. I want to speak to you. I've entitled the message tonight, What Are My Options? Say, what are my options? What are my options? Pastor Delina will tell you because he and I spent decades in the greater Detroit area. I got off the plane today in the car service that picked me up. It was a young lady from Venezuela. She said, where are you from? I said, uh, in Metro Detroit. She said, uh, isn't that to where they make the cars? I said, yes, it is. And Pastor Tim will tell you that uh, my father, who influenced my life greatly in the ministry, he was the general superintendent, the top office in the Assemblies of God for 14 years. My dad in ministry uh, never really liked to golf. He said, Brad, you can't be a good golfer and a good preacher at the same time. He never liked to jog. He never liked to play tennis. He, uh, what his hobby was where he would decompress is he would decompress on used car lots. He loved to pull into a used car lot and just walk around. He's 86 years old, and it's still nothing for him when I call him on a weekly basis, several times a week, that I'll say, Dad, well, let's talk about the Word, and then wh what else did you do? That he'll say, well, I bought a couple of cars today, Brad, 86 years of age. And one of the things that my father instructed me from the earliest age is to determine the value of a car that you had to know what were the options on that vehicle. You would determine the value based upon the options. Does it have leather upholstery or was it cloth? Or back in the day, was it vinyl? Does it have a convertible top or is it a rag top or is it just a hard top? Is it a Bose stereo system in it or does it have just basic CD or a navigation system in it? Kind of reminds me of the story. There was a dairy farmer that had an old clunker of a vehicle. And uh, he saw an ad in the newspaper about uh, new trucks for sale and a good price. So he decided he's going to trade in his old clunker. So he goes to the lot where the advertisement had been from and he uh, looks over at the, the vehicle and then he determines, you know what, I want this new model. And he goes to write out a check and the salesman says, you know what, wait, wait, just a minute. You know what, I haven't given you the final cost. And the farmer said, well, I saw the price advertised in the paper. And the salesman said, oh, that's for the basic model. You've got several options. It's going to be a little bit extra. A few months later, after the farmer pulled out with his new pickup, the salesman called the farmer because he wanted to buy a cow for his kid's 4-H project. So the farmer assured him, you know, the salesman, we have several good milk cows for $500 each. So the salesman drove out with his son to the, to the farm and picked out a cow, and then he goes to take out his checkbook, and the farmer said, wait, wait, you know what? I haven't given you the final cost yet. And then he handed the salesman a bill, basic cow, $500. Two-tone exterior, $45. Extra stomach, $75. Milk storage compartment, $60. Straw recycle compartment, $120. Four handy spigots at $10 each, $40. Leather upholstery, $125. Dual horns, $45. Automatic rear fly swatter, $38. Fertilizer attachment, $185. Grand total, $1,233. Can I just say this, Times Square Church? Whether you're buying cars or cows, it's good to know what options are on it and what the bottom line is. Eleanor Roosevelt said these words. One's philosophy is not best expressed in words. It's expressed in the choices one makes. The process never ends until we die, and the choices we make are ultimately our responsibility. The fact of the matter is, in life, Times Square, 
You've got two choices, basically, that you've got to choose between. Whatever happens in your life, whatever happens, you've got two choices. Option A is you can get bitter and you can get angry and you can get hostile and you can get unforgiving. You can let the enemy rob you of the victory in your life and you can die a person that never fulfills the purposes of God for their life. Or option B is this. No matter what happens, you can trust God. You can lay your life before him and believe that he's truly able and he can take all things, Romans 8, 28, and work them together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purposes. You and I can choose choice B. Joseph was a man in the book of Genesis who certainly had his share of days when everything went wrong. Joseph had his share of dark days and rainy nights. And tonight I want to talk to you just about the choices and the options that we have in life. The former chaplain of the U.S. Senate is a man by the name of Peter Marshall. And he said these words, it is a fact of Christian experience that life is a series of troughs and peaks. And in his efforts to get permanent possession of the soul, God relies on the troughs more than the peaks. And some of his special favorites have gone through longer and deeper troughs than anyone else. I would submit to you those words apply perfectly to Joseph. Joseph has just been put in a dark, dirty dungeon with some of the roughest characters in all of Egypt. Not for doing the wrong thing, but the fact of the matter is for doing the right thing. He isn't there because of a bad crime. He's there because he's got good character. And for the better part of Joseph's life, the summary could have been, you know what? Nice guys finish last. Think of the dysfunction that he had to live in. One of 12 brothers from four mothers and one sister. Do you remember her name? Dinah. Good. Yet after being rejected by his brothers, rebuked by his daddy, sold into slavery after being thrown into a dried up well, carried off to a foreign land, falsely accused of attempted adultery, wrongly imprisoned, yet Joseph still sticks with the things of God. Look at the word says in Genesis chapter 39 tonight. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, Potiphar's wife, speaking. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Would you say those words? The Lord was with him. Say it one more time. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Lord, these next few moments, people didn't come to Times Square Church to hear a preacher from Detroit. Came to hear a word from your throne. And so Lord, if you can't speak through me, speak in spite of me to these people that you and I love today. Thank you for Pastor Delina and Cindy and the children and what you're doing here in the church, Lord. May you just do it over and over and over again. Just, Lord, would you just expand the tent stakes of this amazing pace-setting church for your glory? Do it in National Assembly as well in D.C. But, Lord, I pray your anointing tonight in these next few minutes. And if you can't do it, Lord, through me, do it in spite of me for these people tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. After all that, Times Square, Joseph still remains totally devoted to God. Whether he's in the pits, say pits, say prison, say palace, he is going to remain devoted to God. He knew how to handle adversity as well as prosperity. 
And I would submit to you, Joseph is a model for life that each of us can follow. You see, you and I don't have an option, whether we live in Detroit, D.C., or the Queens, or right here in Manhattan. The fact of the matter is, we don't get a choice, a life with pain or without pain. There, we're going to experience rain in our lives, pain in our lives at different times. But when we find ourselves, our dreams delay when we didn't think it would ever turn out like this. I wanna share with you four prison principles tonight. Four don'ts when your dreams are delayed. Four don'ts when your dreams are delayed. First off, when your dreams are delayed, don't require reasons. Look at that verse again. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. The word prison literally in the Hebrew is the word for hole. It's the innermost prison. It, it wasn't an ordinary prison. Here he is. He's under tight security. Joseph's doing hard time, friend. And now again, I repeat it, not for doing the wrong thing. If he had been willing to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife, possibly stays out of the prison. But because he dares to be different, he purposes to be pure, now he finds himself in the dungeon. And can you imagine, Times Square, the conversation the enemy is having with him? I'm sure he whispers in his ear, come on, Joe, you're serving God, and this is the way that God rewards you? Now, Joe... There probably isn't even a God, but the fact of the matter is, he must not be much of a God if there is one, because he can't even keep you out of prison. I'm going to tell you something else, Joe. If there is a God, he sure doesn't love you very much. And the fact of the matter is, Joseph, if there's a God, he doesn't love you very much, but he sure can't keep you out of trouble, certainly. But the fact is, he is a weak and a pitiful God, because this is where you're at. Yet, I would submit to you, Times Square, there's a peace in trusting in the sovereignty and in the omniscience that our Lord never has to say, oops, I need a takeover. If you're in a place tonight where you just don't understand how I got to this place, can I tell you, you're in some pretty good company. Habakkuk, the whole Minor prophet's story was about why. John the Baptist is thrown into prison and he asked Jesus, are you really the one? The apostle Paul says, I'm perplexed. The prophet Joel just threw up his hands and he said, I just don't understand. Pastor Tim and Cindy, where they used to live right in the heart of Detroit, off of Woodward Avenue is actually where the church was. Amazing story, as you, many of you know. But on that avenue, Woodward Avenue, a major spoke out of the inner city of Detroit, they have, still have a Thanksgiving Day parade like you do here in New York City. And what's interesting is before the parade, it's kind of an annual event for my wife and I, she gets up early to start making the Thanksgiving dinner. I get up early and I go downtown Detroit and run in a 10K race. Try and run about 20 to 25 miles a week, thereabouts. Today I got into Central Park and I got lost and, and I was going every which way. Found myself at Cleopatra's Needle and I thought, man, I've, I've moved into a time warp here. But on that parade route, there's a 10K race every Thanksgiving morning before the parade. And it's kind of fun. You'll, you'll be jogging. There's about 10,000 runners, whether it's 5K or 10K. And uh, you'll be slapping high five these kids that are waiting for the parade. They're excited. Come on, old man. You're going to make it. Come on, come on, come on. And I'll go by and high five them. But those kids, most importantly, they're waiting for that parade. They want to see the bands. They want to see the, the clowns. They want to see Santa Claus as he finishes up the parade. And that child that sits on the parade route, they can see about 10 or 15 feet either side of that parade route. 
But there's also a group of people that go and watch the parade. And it's the executives from GM and Ford and Chrysler that go down to the Renaissance Center. It's a huge complex, 70 stories high, right at the base of Woodward Avenue. And you can watch the whole parade route from that 70th floor where those executives are having brunches and just having a great time with their kids. I felt like the Spirit of God dropped in my heart years ago. Brad, that's kind of how you will go about life compared to me. You can see a little bit back, you know, what, what happened Sunday and, and Monday, a holiday yesterday, and you've got a little bit of planning tomorrow, but really whatever happens, happens, right? But the fact of the matter is, our Lord is in heaven. And he is seeing things from a completely different perspective than you and I ever could imagine. He sees the, the beginning of the route. He knows where you were birthed. He knows the numbers of hairs on your head. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow before it ever happens tomorrow. I like what uh, one pastor said, that me trying to understand the ways of God is like me trying to explain to an ant how the internet works. He just can't do it. One of your, our favorite verses of Scripture has got to be Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And the Lord saw the whole parade. He saw when Joseph was going to be prime minister in Egypt, but he also saw Joseph in the pits and in the prison. Psalm 115, 3, what does it say? Our Lord is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Pastor Tim and I have a, a unique um, camaraderie in the ministry because within just a few months, we started churches in the metro Detroit area. He in the heart of the city, Highland Park. I'm out in a community called Brighton, about two uh, spokes out uh, from the metro area, 40 miles from where Pastor Tim was. And my wife and I, when we started the church, we weren't even married. We were, you know, at I was courting her. She was living with her folks. And then uh, we got engaged on the, the first Christmas Eve service that we had. And then almost to the date, we got married in the fall of 1993. And uh, when we started the church, you know, Pastor Delina will tell you, you know, you don't have any kind of resources. I started with 12 people. The youngest was like 65. That's the truth. He was the youth pastor. I'm kidding. But we, we didn't have anything. We didn't have two nickels to rub together. And the Lord sovereignly, I wish I could take the time to tell you, sovereignly gave my wife, who always wanted to be a school teacher, my mother-in-law used to drive by this school this school in Metro Detroit area to drive over to Rochester. And she would point at that school and say, Lord, would you give Rhonda a, class, a teaching job somewhere? And the Lord gave her a job in that school that my mother-in-law was praying over. Unbelievable. But we didn't have really anything except just love for each other and a love for the kingdom. And after a few years, we really started to just say, Lord, would you please give us children? And when we started to just make that our prayer, Rhonda was teaching in the Farmington Hills school system, very elite school system in Metro Detroit. We had, we, God provided for us those first few years just miraculously. But Rhonda was there teaching, and she and about 12 other ladies were uh, without children, but wanting children. And they just kind of all used to joke together, we're going to have kids together, and, and it's going to be great. And uh, they would exchange stories. And immediately when we started to pray, Lord, would you give us kids, uh, some physical issues started to happen for my wife. Started to go to fertility doctors. Started to uh, knock on all kinds of experts' doors. And the fact of the matter is, I can't go into detail because of time, but 
the fact was that all 11 of the other ladies in the Farmington Hills school system got pregnant except for my wife. Finally, the doctor, fertility doctor, called us and just said, hey, you know what, Rhonda? Um, somebody misdiagnosed you way back when, and the fact of the matter is, you're not going to have kids. They should have taken some eggs, and, and, uh, but the fact is, just forget ever having kids. And we were devastated. The pain, when you think about it, hey, here you were doing the work of God and preaching God's word, trying to get a church off the ground, and yet these heathen people that don't even serve the Lord, they can have kids and they can get pregnant, but your wife can't. And I remember calling my father. He was ministering up in Alaska at the time. I said, Dad, I don't understand it. We just had a good cry together. When I went to hang up the phone, Times Square Church, I promise you, it wasn't an audible voice, but as sure as I'm talking to you, when I hung up the phone, the Spirit of God just spoke to my inner man, Brad, you don't have to understand, but you do have to trust me. And in the prisons of life, I would submit to you, Times Square Church, you and I are going to have to go through places where we just simply operate by raw faith. And we say, Lord, we don't understand it, but we do trust you. The Lord said to Moses, Exodus 4.11, it's a powerful passage. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, Moses. And after finishing Bible school and doing a master's and a doctoral degree, can I save you all the time? Here's some heavy theology. He's God and I'm not. And I submit to you, this is, this is where we've got to live. Because Joseph, his commitment was never contingent upon his circumstances. Whether he's in the pit or he's in the palace, he is going to follow the Lord. And so in your life, in my life, when it doesn't look like we imagined, when our dreams are delayed, don't require reasons. Number two, when your dreams are delayed, don't flunk faithfulness. Fast forward a, a, a few verses, and you see there, so the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in, that pr in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph, Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Now, what does that tell you, Times Square? It tells me that Joseph, regardless of the situation, he just keeps serving the Lord. No matter what he's going through, he couldn't understand why he was sold as a slave. He couldn't understand why he was maligned and lied about. But one thing is for sure, he's going to keep serving the Lord. No matter where, no matter what, Joseph is going to be found faithful. And you'll see in the next chapter that you're going to be introduced to Pharaoh's butler and Pharaoh's baker. And they're thrown into prison. But when they're thrown into prison, who's being faithful serving as the prison chaplain? Good old Joseph. And those guys have got to come into that prison and say, you know what, I don't understand. I'm trying to be a good butler. I'm trying to be a good baker. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh gets hacked off. And here I am. I don't understand. And you see, with God, you've got to understand this, Times Square. There are no accidents with the living God. There are only divine appointments. And the truth of the matter was, God's appointments never disappoint. And God has arranged for Joseph to meet this butler. And he, a butler, what does he do? A butler opens doors for people. And that's exactly what this butler is going to do. But if Joseph has not been faithful, and he doesn't remain faithful even in the prison, there's no eventual meeting with Pharaoh. You don't have to understand but you do have to be faithful. I love what Paul the Apostle says. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust, say a trust, 
What's a trust? It's, it's a talent. It's a gifting. A trust must prove faithful. What did Jesus say? Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. I love the story of a, of a man who walks up to a big strapping giant. And the guy that's walking up to him is kind of a smaller guy. And he, he sticks out his, his finger and po pokes the big guy in the chest. And he said, you know what? If I was as big and tall and strong as you, you know what? I'd go right out into the woods and I would find the biggest bear I could find and wrestle him to the ground right now. Big strapping giant looked at the little guy and said, you know what? There's plenty of little bears in the woods too. Can I challenge you at Times Square? I don't sense there's anybody. You're here on a Tuesday night for prayer. But don't be one of those people that say, you know what, if I had a million bucks, you know what I could do? Can I ask, what are you doing with the hundred you have now? Before David could kill a giant, the fact of the matter is he had to take care of a lion and a bear. Before Moses could emancipate all of the Hebrew children, he's got to set some sisters free by a well. And I would submit to you, I need to remind myself, work diligently in the small things and then don't be surprised when the Lord elevates you to greater. You're really seeing a living testimony of a man and a woman that were faithful in Highland Park, Michigan, and God is you going to use them in an even greater dimension. But it, in great part, it's because they were faithful there. You see on the screen, or maybe it's on the screen, it's a... Uh, picture of Michelangelo, it's the Sistine Chapel. And I, I submit to you that you can tell the size of a leader by what causes them to quit, right? And Michelangelo is painting up in, in the, the, the center of, of the, uh, the beautiful mount or the beautiful Sistine Chapel. And he's back in a corner then after a while, and he, and he hears a friend holler up to him, Michelangelo, what are you doing up there? Why are you painting there? No one will ever see it. To which Michelangelo responded and said, I see it, and God will see it. Don't require reasons. Don't flunk faithfulness. Don't revert to resentment. Bitterness Times Square, it's just fermented anger, right? And people often get angry and embittered when something they don't approve of happens to them. And they get bitter when somebody does them wrong. And I would submit to you, there's nothing worse than allowing bitterness to damage our human souls. Look at what happens after Joseph interprets the dream for the butler. He says these words, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Joseph, Times Square, spoke the truth. He spoke the truth to the butler. There was, but there was never a hint of a bitter spirit. I heard Pastor Tim at a men's conference not too long ago. He said, you know, if I had been Joseph, one of the first people I would have gone back and, and knocked on the door of Potiphar's wife and Potiphar. Hey, remember me? When he ascended to be the, the second in command. But there, there he is. He doesn't say anything bad about Potiphar's wife. There's not a hint of vengeance. There's no spirit of bitterness. The average person what they would have done, we would have said, you know what, that pack of skunks, my brothers, you know what, they assassinate, assassinated my character, Potiphar's wife does. Potiphar didn't even give me a trial. Here I am thrown into the prison and forgotten about. And this is what I get. Peter writes these words, Times Square. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing good and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Times Square, you know what the Lord really loves? 
He loves it when you and I, you know what, have to go through a painful experience that we didn't deserve. And yet we exhibit patience and we say, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. God says, I really like that. And when you do good, even when you're suffering. But here's what you got to be careful of. Because Hebrews 12, 15 says this. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Can I just say this? In our lives, we're going to get done wrong. You're going to get burned at different times. I'm, I'm wondering tonight in this great church if there's somebody that, you know what, you've just been done wrong. You got cheated out of an inheritance by a sibling. You, you uh, might be a spouse here today. You gave your husband the greatest years of your life, yet only for him to take off on you. Is there somebody here today Mom and dad, you've treated your children with respect and kindness and generosity, and yet they haven't been faithful to you in return. So somebody here today, you've been mistreated by a church. You did something, you served in a capacity only to get overlooked or not even recognized. Maybe you got passed over for the promotion on the job. And the fact of the matter is, the Lord would speak to you tonight. Would you be careful not to let a root of bitterness take hold in your life? Because bitter person, here's the deal. The bitterness is not hurting the person that you're bitter toward. It's only hurting you. How many people, Mark and Pastor Delina and the others can tell us, the men on the front row serving, how many people have lost out in ministry because they allowed a root of bitterness to take hold in their life? My father called in when I was meeting with the elders before the service, and uh, I was reminded of a story just as I was going to preach tonight. When my dad started out in the Michigan district, he was the DCAP. It was the district youth director in the Assemblies of God polity. And um, in that day, they had assistant DCAPs. And um, they stayed in their church, that man or that woman did. They stayed in their church. But they were kind of um, being groomed for whoever, when that district youth director leaves, that that person that's the assistant would automatically become the person that led that district youth position. And my dad and mother, after serving as a district youth director, they felt led to go to a church in Saginaw. My dad just preached there. They celebrated their 100-year anniversary. And when my parents went, when I was just a little boy, six years of age, I can still remember their, the, the assistant district youth director, he, uh, he babysat us. Uh, he was, I can still remember throwing football. Uh, I'll call his name Bill and promise you that's not his real name. But Bill was a very kind person. But when dad moved to become the pastor at the church in Saginaw, Bill, who was the assistant youth director, thought, I'm the guy. Certainly they're going to pick me. But when the presbytery met, they said, Bill, sorry, you're not the guy. And if you would still ask my parents today, 87 and 86 years of age, that Bill would leave his wife, run off with a secretary, have a child out of wedlock, and never go back to ministry again, they would say that you're crazy. But that's exactly what happened because of a root of bitterness. Could not get over the fact that that was what he thought he should have. And when you and I have dreams that are delayed in life, we can't require reasons, we can't flunk faithfulness, we can't revert to resentment. And a fourth thing, and I'll close, is we don't force the future. The word says this, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. Can I just ask you, how does this guy that gets reestablished to his position how does he have that kind of amnesia that he forgets Joseph? Joseph said, hey, the last words he hears out of Joseph's mouth, don't forget me, but that's what he does. He says, 
however, did not remember Joseph, he forgot him. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Genesis chapter 41, verse 46 says, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So somewhere between 10 and 12 years, Joseph has been in prison, scholars tell us. Here he is, now he's a 30-year-old man. And it seems like everybody has forgotten him. His mother has passed on. The baker's dead. The father thinks he's dead. The brothers have forgotten him. Potiphar's forgotten him. The butler's forgotten about him. Potiphar's wife has forgotten him. Pharaoh doesn't even know him. But friends, I want you to know, God had not forgotten him. God had not forgotten him. And the temptation is, when that man forgets him, because we've all been there, listen to me. I can guarantee you that Joseph is wrestling with, you know what? I can just get a note up to the butler. He can make something happen. If I can just uh, arrange for this whole situation, maybe I can, can make it happen and move the chess pieces around on the table. But you see, Times Square, the problem would have been was Pharaoh hasn't had his dream yet. And so the fact is, if Joseph tries to short circuit things and get ahead of God, they, it's all going to be messed up. And when our dreams are delayed in life, we're often tempted to get ahead of God. My grandfather, Waldo Trask, he was a drunken bartender, gave his life to Jesus, still paying back gambling debts in the ministry. And he always used to tell my dad, Tom, whatever you do, don't politic to get somewhere. Because if you make things happen, when the tough times come, you're going to have to wonder, did God put me here or did I put myself here? But if God put you there, you can go through anything. But if you put yourself there, you're going to go through some difficulties that you never imagined. A man that Pastor Delina and I respect very much, the writings, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the worst thing that can happen to a person is to be successful before he's ready. Psalm 75, 6 and 7 says this, For promotion cometh neither from the east nor the, from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Pastor Delina and I in Detroit, we had many epic basketball competitions. I mean, we, he, he is a New York player. He's intense. I'll let him tell you who got the better of it over the course of time. But the fact of the matter is, in basketball, Mark Batterson's here, Christian College All-American at CBC. I know that for a fact. Good basketball players understand this. That in basketball, you don't just keep trying to shove it against the uh, uh, opponent. You're not just always trying to force your way in. Good basketball players that mature, they let the game come to them. And they strategically watch for those opportunities. And in the providence of God, Times Square, there is a providence in God that you can trust. That very word providence, pro, before, video, sees before. God sees before what you're going to face. He knows what you have need of before he even asks. And so you can trust him. Let me try and illustrate this if I can. A number of years ago, when uh, we were in Michigan, and uh, Pastor Tim, who will tell you that Honor Bound was a men's ministry in, in the Michigan district, I was invited to preach up at this Honor Bound men's conference in Trinity in Flint, Michigan. And it was the same day that University of Michigan, of which I'm a huge fan, I, I live about 15 minutes from the big house where U of M plays. And uh, they were playing for the Big Ten Championship that Saturday. And so on the morning that I was going to speak, I didn't want to know what happened during the game. 
And so I set the DVR and I, I just got in my bubble. Uh, after I got done speaking, I didn't even look at the, the traffic that I was passing the opposite way afterwards. I didn't want to see if any Michigan fans were excited or if they were really depressed. I just left the radio off, drove south on US 23 to our home, got my pizza, sat down in front of the game and watched it. And in the middle of the fourth quarter, Michigan was down by 10 points. And I'm feeling really, really bummed. I mean, it just was. I was hopeful. And at that time, my wife comes in to the house, said, hey, honey, how did it go at the conference? I said, it went really well. She said, wasn't it incredible how Michigan came back and won today? But can I tell you, look up here, Times Square. I watched the last seven minutes of that game with a totally different perspective. I didn't care if they fumbled the ball. I didn't care if they threw a, a down and out and out of bounds. I didn't care because the fact of the matter was I knew who was going to win. And I don't know what you're going through today, but I can promise you the Word of God tells us you're going to win. You are going to be victorious. The word says that you and I, but thanks be unto God who always, always, say always, always leads us in triumphant procession. So the fact of the matter is, let God do the vindicating. Let him watch over your life. Humble yourselves, therefore, Peter said. Why humble yourself? Because God opposes the proud. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. When all we can see is the pits, our Lord sees the palace. Would you stand with me and just give me two more minutes? When all we can see is the pits and the prisons, the Lord sees the palaces. Joseph's not all hacked off. Genesis 39, the Lord was with him. 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 And it was all so they could lift him up in due time. Look what the psalmist states. Would you say this as a prayer in your own heart as I read it? Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. So let me just bring it full circle, if I can. You may think that you've been forgotten. You may think in this tri-state complex, you know what? Eight, 10 million people, who am I? Can I tell you? The Lord knows exactly where you're at. He knows that you're here tonight. He knows if you're watching online. I love what Pastor Tim said in a devotion. I, I jotted it down a couple years back. He said, think about this, that Joseph was closer to the palace when he was in the prison than even when he was back in his dad's house. He was closer in the pits and in the prison than he was at daddy's house. And you may think that God's forgotten you. Let me remind you, he sees the whole parade. Don't require the reasons. Don't flunk faithfulness. Don't revert to resentment. Don't try and make it happen. Don't force the future. So let me just share with you, for us, Ron and I, we are married for 19 years. We weren't able to have children. But when God's in something, he just puts it all together. 
And you don't even have to work to see it happen. God just sovereignly, 10 plus years ago, got a, an email from a lady in our church. Are you still open to adoption? I remember calling my wife down in my office. How do you want me to respond to this? It's never going to happen. Rhonda just said, you know what? Just tell them we're open. From that email response, the Lord just drops a son into our home. Yeah. Do you have that? Two and a half years later, then the Lord gives us Eleanor, Eli and Ellie. Yeah. But let me just tell you one more thing, and then we'll close, and I'll just invite you to pray with me, and then I'll turn it over to Pastor Delina. When all we could see was heartache and disappointment, the Lord saw these two come into our lives, right? But the Lord's even allowed for a Joseph experience in our life. Because of that adoption, the, the Lord has just opened up a ministry for my wife in foster care and adoption. Recently, recently, she's been appointed by the governor, two governors removed within the last few years, to raise up faith-based awareness the government is asking my wife to get churches on board so we can foster children. <laughs> Only a great God. The government comes to the church where it ought to happen, right? But if we get embittered and angry, it never comes to pass. The kids and the opportunity. So I just want to ask you, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, two quick questions. Are you here today and you've either drifted from the Lord or you've never surrendered to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Today's your day, friend. God has you here by divine appointment. And all you've got to do is say, yes, Lord. I surrender to you. If that's you, you just want to come back to the Lord or you just want to surrender to him for the first time, you want to come to Jesus, just lift your hand nice and high. Would you do that? If that's you, just surrendering to the Lord, you just say, that's me. I want to ask the believer this question now. And you can just open your eyes. Remember? Whenever you read the word, the word reads you. And the word may have read you tonight. Are you here tonight and it just doesn't look like you imagined? Don't get embittered. Don't try and make things happen. Trust in the Lord and just stay faithful. If that's you tonight, you love Jesus, but man, you just never saw this or like you thought it was going to be like this. Just lift your hand. Would you do that? Can I ask you? If you're a preacher like me or you're a parishioner like many of you, you just got your hand raised. And just say, Lord, I never imagined it like this, but I trust you. Just as the worship team sings that, would you just step out into the altar and just come and stand before the Lord and just say, Lord, I trust you tonight. As they begin to sing it, would you do that, team? As you, you just lift your hand and say, that's me. I, I'm a candidate for God's blessing. 